Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I'm going to do a little recording today to update everybody on some of the current information about sports hernias and abdominal strains, lower abdominal strains. Uh, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to go through a little bit today to give you the updated information, but also stick uh, stick around for the whole video so I can show you some of the great stretches that really work well for a lot of these scenarios. Um, obviously, if you have this problem, you should be seen by a medical professional. It doesn't need to be a medical doctor, but it can be a sports chiropractor, physical therapist, physiotherapist, and so on. Um, a lot of times treating this on your own is really challenging. Um, and we're going to go through some of those um, aspects today in the slide. So let me do a screen share with you guys. Um, this is um, information that I took um, recently from a um, one of the... Uh, we do research updates every once in a while uh, in our office, and I put some of the stuff together, uh, mainly for some of the interns that we have. Um, I presented it to them, and so there's going to be some information that may be a little bit technical for everybody, maybe, but also at the same time, I'll try to boil it down to make sure that we all have a good understanding um, of what's going on uh, and what you guys should possibly do about it later. So first thing is you see the highlighted area, the yellow. This is the area that I'm talking about. Uh, also, the lower abdominal region is really common with this. Um, a lot of times people will call them sports hernias. Um, as you'll see as we go through the slide today, today the sports hernia is so vague. Um, and I've seen people ha come in being told they have sports hernias when they have pubic bone pain, when they have pain into the area where her fingers are at, to the lower abdominal region, all the way down into the adductor tendon, which is down to the lower half um, of, of where she's at. Um, so this is from a, a research article I pulled for 2020, growing pain in active individuals and athletes without clinical evidence of hernia or hip pathology. Let's see if I can move that little, where's my little face over here? Um, I'll move him down to maybe the left corner, upper left corner, upper right. Um, without clinical evidence of, of hernia or hip pathology findings is challenging for healthcare clinicians and aggravated, aggravating for those experiencing the pain. Frequently called sports hernias or athletic pubalgia, many surgeons continue to refute the diagnosis because there's lack of clear uh, of consensus, uh, consensus and clear comprehension of the basic pathophysiology associated with the problem. And so basically, it's it, in so many words, it's like, we don't know what the hell's going on. And so it's like, why would we do a surgery on something where we're not quite sure what's going on? Um, observations in the next section is understanding the anatomical and the pathophysiological findings in groin pain syndrome is, is necessary to begin or to appropriately treat this problem. In general, the, low, the level of evidence of literature is relatively low, but we do know that exercise-based therapy can be an effective first-line therapy for individuals who develop groin pain syndrome. Uh, surgical therapies are typically reserved for those who experience non-operative management failure, meaning they don't, they don't actually get better with rehabilitation or exercise-based therapy, um, and so on. So anyways, um, this is a really nice starting point, I think, for general understanding for everybody that it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging scenario. Like, um, I wish we can say we've all figured this thing out, but we haven't. And so part of this uh, presentation that we're going to go through today is mainly based upon, here's what I think is going on based upon the people that we've seen. Um, I've seen a bunch of people with growing pain. Uh, quote unquote, sports hernias, real sports hernias, lower abdominal strains, high adductor strains, and so on. And so these are all kind of placed in that category. Now, uh, the mechanism of injury is important. Uh, we always kind of say that if you have the problem, you have to merit the reason why. Um, I can't have a hole in my head and say that I didn't fall. Like there has to be a mechanism for the problem. And so if you have something like a tear that's formed, um, you have to have the associated trigger or this associated mechanism. So athletes will typically complain of gradual increase of activity related lower abdominal and proximal or that's high adductor related pain, usually associated with the uh, acute movement of trunk, which is the kind of core hyperextension, lumbar hyperextension, low back hyperextension, hip hyperabduction, uh, a mechanism abductions kind of away as if as if this athlete on the left is cutting away he's he's changing directions um, common like in hockey soccer and so on and so if you don't have the mechanism then you really can't have the problem 
in so many words. It doesn't mean you can't have groin pain, but it means that you don't have a quote unquote sports hernia. Now, uh, rest helps, but oftentimes reoccurrence occurs when activity resumes, such as with, with your cutting and pivoting athletes. Um, uh, I should mention too, uh, this is different than a hernia. This is not an abdominal hernia. No, we're not going over abdominal hernias at all in this in this um, presentation. We're going over groin pain. All right, so they're different animals. So, just food for thought. This is a lot of times that pe people, people, um, when they come in and we discuss things with them, they're they're confused about what's going on. They say, "Well, I've had a normal MRI or a normal ultrasound, and I don't, I still have pain. What the heck?" Right. And so, if we go up to the first question there, what's the symptom generator? If there is one at all, sometimes pain doesn't even really have a symptom generator that you can see on an image. And it's just mind blowing sometimes to think that, but I think we've been conditioned as a culture to think that every problem associated with pain means you can see it and you can't, right? It doesn't mean it has a positive MRI finding. Um, the mental anguish that people have after like a bad breakup is painful, but it's not seen on an image, right? Um, Phantom pain syndrome, which is when people have their arm cut off, like, um, you know, like for uh, an explosion or something like that, like it's re their arm is now gone, still have pain in their arm. It's not there. So there's other reasons for pain. A sunburn is an example, too. If you have a sunburn, you don't have a positive MRI of it or an ultrasound. There's nothing that will show on it. And that's OK. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't get better. It just means that if we kind of work, um, if we if we go backwards a little bit in our thinking and think, why why am I in pain? And think about that it's not actually always associated to a structure. It changes the uh, the way you would manage it. You don't have to always fix something, right? It, there's nothing to fix sometimes. It just means that you're in pain. Uh, and sometimes because you're loading the area too much. Um, and so with that being said, is surgery, surgery always recommended if conservative care fails? Um, not necessarily. Um, sometimes the conservative care is like they're different. Um, what you might experience at one physical therapy clinic versus another at one chiropractic clinic versus another, everybody's different. I'm sure, uh, some of you, or a lot of you, you have jobs, you probably have other colleagues who do a similar job, but in a different way. And so that's all of what happens in conservative care. There's no consistency whatsoever, especially since we see in the, in this slide, there's really not a good understanding of what the heck's going on. And so you need to go somewhere where they've had a good success with the area. Um, and if you are going to go to an office, which is advised you go see somebody, um, you may ask them, how much experience do you have with this problem? Uh, have you successfully helped people get over it? Um, what's um, like, what percentage of people do you see? What do you guys specialize in? You know, uh, there's always a possibility that you have the wrong diagnosis. All right. If you're not getting better. There's also the possibility the workload of the, uh, the workload of the tissue or the person is not considered. All right. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of reasons why you would have a normal image, but also have pain associated with it. And sometimes you're just overworking a tissue, but not to the point of complete terror failure. All right. Uh, it's like holding a, um, uh, there, uh, Stuart McGill has a good analogy of, he called it the butter in the bicep. If you hold some butter and you got your bicep right here and it takes, you know, like you're holding it for five minutes, it's okay. If you hold it for five hours, it's not okay anymore and it hurts, but it's not an indication that you have any positive image of any type, okay? It's just overloading tissue. Um, you also have to reverse engineer the problem, which we're gonna go into in a couple slides here of if, you're, if your tissue is getting overloaded, why? What is not doing the work to make it so that you're actually working too much in that region? Uh, and in treatment and therapy, it's always best thing to pick the low hanging fruit, which we're gonna go over a few of the things in, in a little bit. Um, the, some of my favorite stretches um, and positions to help people with groin pain re uh, really feel better quickly, but it doesn't always build a tolerance either. So um, here's what I understand the, the pathomechanics being. Uh, the, so there's a decrease of internal rotation ability in one or both hips that's said to lead to excessive rotation of the pubic symphysis. If you look over in the picture on the right here, um, there's a hip on the left, and then you can see in the center with the like dialing type of approach there. That's um, that's a that's a joint uh, right around the pubic bone or or the or your pubic region. There's a joint. It's called the pubic symphysis, and so it doesn't tolerate a lot of shear. 
But if you require it to do a lot of shear, then it will say something. It will hurt. It may hurt on your pubic bone or it may hurt in adjacent areas such as the adductor tendon uh, and so on. Okay. Now, um, this is from another study. Uh, again, they, the, it's, it's a really common problem to have the adductor tendon feel tight. It should, it, it feel, it's, it's common to feel the rectus abdominis area as these areas and turn into the pubic bone feel tight. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, this problem, the sports hernia is often characterized by abdominal or groin pain. It's super common. I want to say the groin pain is like, uh, seven, like 95% of people will have pain with resisted adduction. Meaning if you squeeze your, your knees together, it will hurt. It's 95%, but also it's common with other types of groin pain too. Um, and they say that this area becomes overworked, it weakens, and then possibly there's tearing um, tearing of the ab uh, abdominal wall without, without having any true findings of an actual uh, intestines coming out with a true hernia. Um, but this is an overload of tissue. Why is it being overloaded? Perhaps it's the lack of internal rotation of the hip um, or a lack of function of a hip. Uh, in that case, we have to reverse engineer a little bit further to figure out why. This is a uh, interesting uh, part. There was a study done in 2015 um, where they took this uh, cam, there's cam deformities. Um, so it's basically a type of hip impingement, uh, limitations of hip range of motion. Um, it, they're very common with a lot of athletic youth. You end up getting them because you're an athletic younger individual. And then you have it throughout the rest of your life. It's a, it's a shape of, of the hip, um, the hip joint which could limit some movement. And it's proposed that some of the cam impingement um, can lead to increased movement of the pubic symphysis, which may overload the surrounding tissues, such as the extra articular areas in the joint, the muscles, uh, and so on, which can lead to things like sports hernias or athletic and or athletic pubalgia. Uh, for patients with hip impingement and sports hernia, the surgical management of both pathologies or both problems is said to be more effective than just only treating one or the other. Um, and look at the numbers at the bottom was 80, 89% if you treat both and 33% if you really just only treat one. Um, now, I'm not saying everyone needs surgery on this, but what we can extrapolate from this is that if you have groin pain or you have a sports hernia or you have a low abdominal strain or a um, adductor tendon who keeps becoming active or tender, if you don't address the underlying cause, in this case, it's the lack of hip function, then uh, it will come back and or probably will come back. I, I can't tell the future, but it will probably come back. Um, most people lack internal rotation of the hip. Now, if you have hip arthritis, really bad hip arthritis, you're not going to get that part back. But a lot of people who are younger under the age of 40 will be able to do that. They'll be able to get it back. Now, if you're over 40, I'm not saying you can't get it back either. It's just sometimes they'll have to be a little bit more of a um, uh, like people will have it for a long time and, and the bone reaction will create limitations of hip range of motion. Uh, here's another study which proves that point. Uh, they analyzed um, cadavers and they simulated a cam deformity. The picture on the left is a cam deformity. It's just a bony uh, prominence that grows again because you're athletic as you're younger. By the way, a lot of people do have cam deformities and have no pain whatsoever but they may lack some hip range of motion that can be partially returned. They found that rotating the people, uh, the, the cadavers or the hips, they had the cam lesion simulated, um, repetitively put more load on the pubic symphysis. So this kind of proves that point uh, of one possibility. Um, now, if we look at some of the musculature around the area, so there's the obliques, the adductors, um, and there's the rectus abdominis as well. On the picture on the left, you see the transverse abdominis, and then there's the pec major, in this case, with the thrower. And so they, we call this the anterior oblique sling. It does matter. And so all of these things will work together. I'd love to say we can separate just the adductors. We're only going to treat the adductors today. No, you treat everything, right? You help everything work together. As I mentioned earlier, things need to work together. And when you rehabilitate the area, things need to work together too, okay? There's also a concept of intra-abdominal pressure, okay? Okay. Um, the picture on the right is um, this is uh, someone with possibly better intra-abdominal pressure than the one on the left. This is a lifter. This is not somebody would who would technically have a mechanism for a sports hernia because they're not they don't have them they don't have 
the the mechanics. They don't have the possibility of it. Now, the pitcher on the left, this is Randy Johnson. Uh, he does have the mechanics of it because it could be low back hyper or trunk hyper extension with hip hyper uh, adduction and possibly extension too. It's going to be his trail side leg, but the person on the right does not necessarily have that. Intra-abdominal pressure is a protective mechanism, which I'll, de which I'll de describe in a little bit. And we'd theorize that lack of better pressure, intra-abdominal pressure can lead to lack of hip range of motion, which can increase the amount of shear on the pubic symphysis, which will create some of the problems, okay? Now, the picture on the left, uh, in, in the USA, we have Batman. I'm not sure if Batman made it around the world or not, but uh, Batman and Robin are superheroes. Like, they, they're doing everything they can to protect Gotham City. Um, they are the heroes in this situation. Uh, they are also, if we extrapolate back into the um, musculature of the body um, associated with groin pain, they are the adductor and the uh, rectus abdominis. They're trying to help, as well as the TFL muscle and so on, like hamstring. They're trying to help, okay? A lot of times, if you have the poor hip internal rotation, it'll get more movement in the pubic symphysis, which will make some of these heroes start to work extra. Stuff's going wrong, so they need to step up, all right? And at some point, they may fail and create a tear. You know, they will break down, which may create adaptation in those tissues and those superheroes, which will also create sensitivity of those tendons and musculature of things like the adductor, the rectus abdominis muscle, and all the muscles around the hip joint, period. But we bring up the possibility of intra-abdominal pressure, which is uh, helps things work optimally within the hip and the core region. As I mentioned, the mechanics is low back hyperextension with a movement of the hip. And so intra-abdominal pressure, IAP, helps out to actually protect and allow those movements to happen because they should, be, they should happen. But if they happen with um, not enough support repetitively over time, then you could have a problem where the musculature, which becomes a problem, steps in, the superheroes, right? So chronically poor pressure with movements or uh, movement patterns and increase in the reps over time can create the muscles to work harder and they create habits that are harder to break. Then you get poor internal rotation, you get more movement at the symphysis, and then you have the tendons become sensitive and so on. And so with this being said, I know this uh, is kind of um, kind of uh, rhetorical question. When stuff goes wrong in Gotham City, who do you blame? Do you, mean, do you blame Batman and Robin for not working hard enough? Or do you blame the mayor who's making it so that we're in this situation? I'd say we blame the mayor. So although a lot of treatments associated with groin pain, hip pain, are associated with treating the superheroes when they break down, I think it's the completely wrong approach. Okay, You should be addressing the mayor. Make sure the mayor is doing their job and clean up the situation. And that's going to be better movement patterns. It's going to be um, strength and range of motion within the hip, as well as making sure that the person has adequate pressure. Okay. So I propose these strategies to make the situation better. You cool down the area to build it up. A lot of you have probably already done this. You said, oh, my hip hurts and uh, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm going to rest it. And then things feel better until you go back to activity and then they don't. So you did part one, you cooled it down, but then you have to build it up in a strategic way, which this is the point of uh, injury rehabilitation or creating adaptation around the area. You, nothing you're going to do is actually going to make it so that tear goes away. That's number one. It's going to be there. All right. And it doesn't need to be fixed per se. It just needs to, your body has a new normal, right? It has a new normal situation. Tears do not always hurt. But once it's torn, it's torn. It's not going to be like a brand new car anymore. That's just the way it is. And that's okay. All right. But we need to teach the body to do some movements that don't perpetuate the process. I remember in a, in a uh, shoulder uh, study, they did um, repeated MRIs on people when they ha had pain in the shoulder. They had confirmed tears, partial tears of a rotator cuff muscle. Uh, and they said, okay, you got a rotator cuff tear. Go on around the world and then come back when you have shoulder pain and we're going to image you again. And so they did that and they came back and they found that the person's tear or the person's pain was associated to expansion. The thing got a little bigger. And so that means that number one, tears don't hurt. But as you start to challenge the tissue a little bit more and be, if it does tear a little bit more, it might hurt more. Okay. But that's not always the case either. 
And so the best thing to do is cool it down and then create a, uh, a program to then make the body move better so you don't perpetuate the tear, right? This is the whole thing that when you do corrective exercises and work with someone who's coaching you, this is why, okay? is The reason is because uh, habits are hard to break, all right? Um, the pressure, if you have a pressure issue, intra-abdominal pressure, you need to be coached. Some people make it on their own. They, they can do it on their own. But the longer you've had this, the harder it is, all right? And I'm brutally honest with people about it. Um, it's better just to have someone coach you. A lot of times, uh, so I, I've met ballerinas who um, they, um, the ones I'm thinking about, they they spend a lot of time going to ballet class. They go to ballet class and I just learned about ballet class recently and I realized that ballet class is the same thing over and over again. It's the same thing. It's because you're improving your skills at doing those things really well. And so um, moving in a better way that doesn't trigger your problem or increase the possibility of tears is also requires weekly, bi-weekly, every month interactions sometimes for some people because it's not easy to change, all right? I've had habits for a lot of years too. You know, this hand movement in the camera, I've been doing it for years. Try to break me of it, all right? And it's not gonna happen quickly and you may need to coach me through it and that's the whole point of thing. So to be able to change the habit, which we call it an attractor state, we're changing the habit. Also, you need to, um, uh, Put uh, get back a hip inter rotation if you still have availability availability to it. The only way you can figure that out is is have someone do an examination with you. And when you go back in activity, don't spike your activity. We see this all the time in New Year's uh, New Year's Day. People are like, "Oh, I haven't worked out in like five months, and I'm going to go and do a bunch of stuff," and they get hurt. Or we saw uh, a, actually after the stay at home order, people weren't being physically active, and they said, "You know what? Club sports are back. I'm going to take my kid out." And where he's going to do soccer and baseball on the same season, morning and night, and all of a sudden, kid got hurt. Uh, we noticed a lot of people actually doing less activity and then doing spikes of activity had a big jump in their in their problem or new problems. And so, uh, it doesn't surprise me that sports hernias are oftentimes associated with you don't do anything, it goes away, and you start doing something, it comes back. It's because most people rest it too darn long. So a lot of times you got to add things like drills and um, ways to challenge the area without really making things worse uh, immediately. And working with someone directly can help out with that. Um, the last thing is you are in your own, you have your own destiny. Okay. You are in control of it. Um, I know a lot of you have thought like, ah, this is not getting any better. Really, you are in complete control. You are the deciding factor whether you want to work with someone professionally or not. Okay. There's a lot of people who will get through this on their own, but there's a lot of people who won't. And a lot of people who won't, they end up in our office and we work with them and they tend to get better. Okay. But you can have years and years on your life where you really are not doing any physical active because you are in complete control. Okay. Now, um, here's just some accessory information before we get on to some of the stretches. Um, so Yonda is so um, it was about Vladimir Yonda, if you want to look at lower and upper cross syndrome. These are very interesting reads. Uh, and it pairs really well with what we call this the DNS open scissors type of scenario, okay? There's a few types of muscles in the body. There's tonic and phasic. Tonic ones are, as I mentioned earlier, we have these guys. We have these uh, uh, chronic tonic dom uh, chronic muscle uh, tonic muscle dominance chronically in this scenario. Um, tonic muscles are the ones that help out a lot. And, um, man, I got to get back to that slide. There's a lot of clicking. And so if you get the tonic muscles to only do the work, then they will at some point break down. Now, um, the phasic muscle groups are the ones that if you've ever been uh, in a training facility or someone's coaching you or you've read online uh, how, about, how to decrease hip pain, they say, well, your X, Y, and Z muscles are off. Those are the phasic groups. And they're not off, they're just dormant or lazy. In the picture on the right, we have the glute max, which is a, is, is a, one of the tonic ones, or the phasic ones, which really need some help. The one on the left, the iliopsoas, the rectus spinae, the rectus femoris, um, and so on, are their tonic group. They have an affinity to help. They are the superheroes. They're trying to help. They work overtime, and at some point, they will become painful if you allow it to. Now, there's a whole list of tonic and phasic group muscles, and you might notice that if you go through and you go on tonic phasic muscles on Google, and then you do a little search and see what they are, you're going to realize that all those muscles that are tonic are the ones that people complain about and they go to a doctor's office for. 
and their massage therapist says, oh, this is so tight. You have the tightest X, Y, and Z muscle. They're all tonic. No one says I have the tightest glute max in the world. I mean, people could, I guess, but they usually don't. And so usually those are the ones that need to help out a little bit. If you're wondering why certain groups work more than others, it, it comes down to the level of the energy systems of the muscles, which I won't get into today. Now, uh, DNS means dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. And we have a scenario we call the open scissors, which um, um, is the picture on the right. Okay, the spine's extended, the pelvic has an anterior tilt, the diaphragm's oblique, and there's suboptimal distribution of, of pressure within the abdominal cavity. And there's excessive compression on, in this case, it talked about the lumbar disc and the joints, but also to some of the musculature works a little bit over time. The tonic group is dominating. The one on the left is better, at least if we're trying to rehabilitate somebody. It's not to say you can't ever extend your back or be open like that. You can, but a lot of times uh, if you're in pain, you can't get away with it is all. Um, some people can get away with it. Some people can't. Um, here's a scenario of um, possibly, I guess I should mention too, there, there's three reasons why people can have groin pain, generally speaking. There's, there's problems within the joint, which would be intra inside hip problems. And then there's extra, which is outside hip problems. And then there's referred to hip. Um, actually I'd venture to say that probably of the hip and groin and lower abdominal pain that we see, a lot of times I'd say easily 50% of them are actually in the scenario of referred. They're the third category. They're spinal referred or in that same category, it's just overload. Okay. Now things within the, um, uh, intra inside is going to be, you know, hip capsule, labrum, or hip arthritis, things like that. Outside is going to be more like your tonic muscles, um, your tendons and so on. And then there's the referred to, which in this picture is uh, some of the uh, nerves that come from the back, which can be trapped in some of the tissues running alongside the hip. Um, but also interesting, this can go to the scrotum on men. Uh, I don't know if it goes to the labia on women or not. Um, I would imagine it probably could. I think I heard a couple of stories where it has, um, but it's not, I guess it's not necessarily pain. It's more of a tightness feeling. It's an odd feeling that, that the men experience, um, but it doesn't mean women can't have it either. Uh, there's a, if you trace all those nerves down a little bit, you can see that these can mimic things like front of groin pain and tightness and stiffness, TFL, muscle tightness, uh, rectus uh, femoris, insertional or origin type of problems, high adductor. And then if you see um, a little bit higher, you see the lower abdominal region, which we're going to show. Um, actually, I don't have another picture of that one. Um this was part of the research update too that we did was the lower abdominal symptoms, which is confusing to a lot of people. You know, there, I think there's a good, there's a good reason why it's confusing, but if you consider the neurology in the area, actually there's a higher possibility that you, um, uh, there, I mean, it makes good sense to me, although this isn't for everybody. Um, there's two, there's two uh, no nerves that pass into the structures of the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is the canal that in, in men goes down to the, um, uh, to the scrotum. Uh, these nerves are the ilioinguinal and the genital femoral nerves. A third nerve, the ilohypogastric, supplies the sensation to the area above the genitalia but does not pass through the inguinal canal. It pierces the transverse abdominis, then the external oblique, and goes to the inguinal region. You can see the picture on the right, the ilohypogastric nerve goes to the lower abdominal region. Okay, and, and over here it's presented, uh, it's not labeled, uh, actually it is labeled, I, I take it back, um, it's, it's up on the upper left. Um, and there's a branch that goes just above the genital region. You can see on the right side before the scrotum, it kind of branches off into two. And that's actually a really common scenario that people have. A lot of times what we find with these people is, um, when they have like the, um, I guess I take it back. So sometimes the, the so the history has to make sense. Just as I said, the, the mechanism needs to make sense. The history needs to make sense too. Okay. If you have a sports hernia, you will not have numbness of your foot. So I've had people come and say, well, I have groin pain because I have a sports hernia and I have a numb foot. That's that's not right. They're, they're, it's, you're probably going to have a back nerve thing and it's creating the sports hernia phenomenon. Uh, my urine, uh, it hurts to urinate. Well, that might be a kidney stone, you know. My piriformis muscle hurts, my hamstring and my tight, uh, sorry, my piriformis hamstring and calf are tight. 
Now, those are uh, maybe that's normal for you, but if this is going along with the groin pain, then these are things that is po po possibly nerve related again. And then we have the what the hell phenomena. Um, I like to call this like it's like it's not a smoking gun for anything, but it doesn't make any sense. Um, we had someone recently um, where I was trying to challenge their hamstring by pulling on their leg while they were face down, which would be like a hamstring curl. And I said, where do you feel this? And she said her quad doesn't make any sense, right? So in that scenario, it's best to look at the spine or possibly referred because if she had a real hamstring tear in this scenario, it would light up the hamstring. There's no question about it. We're loading the hamstring and we're spreading the tear. So there's the what the hell phenomenon. Uh, the mechanism must present in, uh, uh, must be present in history too. So how did this all start? Well, I woke up with the sports hernia. Mm. It's not a sports hernia then. Uh, I drove across the country and I was sitting too long. Not It's it's not a hyperextension low back and add a hyperadduction injury to the leg. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, I started to work out and lose weight and now I have this. Maybe it depends on the workout that you, you pick. I play soccer weekly in a competitive rec league. Yeah, sure. It could be a sports hernia or a high adductor strain or something like that. I was training for a marathon. Probably not. The hyper adduction movement, the, the leg going across like away from the body, like changing direction was not really there. Uh, and I've had some before. They said, I'm a businessman. I lift weights. I run a mile a day. Um, and I have uh, an, an image showing that I have tears to my high add adductor tendon. And I pulled um, my abdominal muscle off the fascia. And so um, maybe. But the thing is that, again, the the history doesn't really match. Now, this is a scenario of the superheroes. Has, have the superheroes been doing too much too long? And when the superheroes are working a lot, they can create uh, long-term um, findings in images that would insinuate possible things like sports hernia, um, adductor tears, um, abdominal strains, and so on. But, but normally, again, uh, this is a long-term process that people have. So um, when people are ruling things out with you, they need to um, consider a few categories. There's, again, like I mentioned, there's the inside joint. This is a knee, by the way. This is an inside joint, outside joint, referred to joint, and there's what we call red flag. Red flag means that, I mean, you could have cancer. Um, you could have an infection. There, it could be referred from an organ. There's a lot of reasons why people would have a red flag. When you're ruling things out, you need to consider, someone needs to, when they're working with you, they need to rule out the red flag first and then referred, and then outside the joint, and then inside the joint. That's just the ordered process. Now, a lot of times when we work with people um, and they, like, like when we're talking to them, we first try to figure out, have they been ruled, have we ruled out the red flags? Um, if they have not, then we do it with them. Um, but if they're somewhere where they're, um, they're going to see their local physician or a physical therapist, a chiropractor, um, they can all do this exam. It's part of the history too. Like um, part of your history intake form will have things that insinuate possible red flags. Now, Doctor Google scares people a lot of times with this. It's like you could have this and it's that. It's not wrong, uh, but all and it's way less common. But you have a responsibility to do right by yourself and make sure that that's not a problem at all. Because if it was, you'd have a very different treatment plan, and you'd have a very different problem. Okay. But all the other stuff is very manageable with a rehabilitative approach and using exercise as a, as a means to, to get rid of it. Um, last thing I'll cover kind of the techie stuff is going to be this part. If you guys want to learn a little bit more about like uh, muscular injuries and why images are not necessarily always positive, this is a great research paper. It's open access. You can find it. Just Google this in part. And as you look down into here, you'll see that not until actually... 3A, which is a partial muscle muscle tear, if you look way off on the right, uh, and not until 3A, is there any positive ultrasound or MRI findings at all? And so things like sciatica, you're not going to find a hamstring tear with it, which is 2A. 2B is like that uh, open scissor. You're loading it too much. You're making the, the superheroes work too much, but they're not broken yet. You're not going to find a positive image of that. And there's, there's even things like delayed onset muscle soreness in there, which is soreness associated with too much activity too soon, which is 1B. And so these are things that have not been considered over the years, but really need to be when we're ruling things in, ruling things out, okay? 
If an MRI is negative, an ultrasound is negative, then you don't have a big muscle tear. But even if you did, does it really matter? Is this a surgical case? No. As we saw in the first slide, we know that movement uh, related therapies, exercise therapies is the first go. It's always the first go. Okay. Uh, and you can start that without having to actually do an image either. Okay. Um, prevalence of having the sports hernia, true one in soccer, way higher than someone who's a lifter. Okay. A lifter, if you're a CrossFitter, a gym goer, you could still have groin, lower abdominal strains. Like I've met people who have had um, lower abdominal strains associated with deadlifting, um, associated with overhead pressing. Uh, we had someone who did a snatch the other day and they felt it too. And they were concerned they had a sports hernia. No, but you could have other types of groin strain, uh, which is very easy to manage. Okay. And let's see, we can get by this part. Um, this was for all the, for all the other people that we were, uh, it, it was for the, uh, the students. Okay. Now let me just tap into this really quickly here. So this was a slide that everyone may be familiar with. They've been to an optometrist. The optometrist has a really easy job, I think, associated with figuring out what, um, uh, AB testing. I'm sure they have a hard job with other things, but AB testing is really nice. And so they say, is this better or is this better? They flip it. Right. And so immediately you're like, Oh, I see better B B is better. Now A is better. Now B is better. And so you're dialing in the right prescription for your problem, which in that, this case is sight. Now, you can do the same thing with certain rehabilitation, rehabilitative exercises. The goal is to reverse engineer um, the process with uh, exercise. And so the hard thing for sometimes for people to understand is that the exercises can have an immediate effect within a minute or two, just like this scenario here, just like it, okay? And that is the best way to use exercises and stretches and positions to make it so you can actually get on with your life and get back to activity, okay? I know that there's a, there's a preconceived notion where people say, well, it takes a long time to get strong. It does, but this is not always a strength issue. Sometimes this is just a phasic muscle issue, or it's a problem with intra-abdominal pressure, which can be coached very quickly, and then you have to do the, do the good work to retain it. But you can find an immediate change. And we've had people with immediate changes, um, whether they have confirmed hip arthritis or a diagnosis that says sports hernia or in abdominal strains, like you name it, we've had AB testing um, treatments or, exam or, or stretches or exercises that can work just like that helps out so much. And we can help you find stuff like that. Okay. And so we're going to go next into um, just uh, a few of the stretches that I like to do, I think are a high bang for buck. Um, I'm going to show you and I'm, I'm going to reposition myself a little bit, but as I do so, I'll continue to talk a little bit. All right. Obviously, if you guys are having problems, you need to be seen side by somebody and you can always uh, see us. We're in Costa Mesa, California, and we see people virtually for this type of stuff, too. Uh, we do a very good job virtually. Uh, we're very honest. And if we don't feel like we can help you, we'll say something. OK, this is the first one I like to do with people uh, just because it's so easy. It's a very simple position. And in this case, we have the involved groin and hip up. And we just use a pillow underneath the body here and just hang out just like so. It's going to seem like the simplest thing in the world. And it is. And you spend about a minute or so here and just breathe and relax. Okay. And then you go arm overhead just like so whenever you're ready. It shouldn't feel like you're doing anything at all. Okay. This is the starting point first aid exercise we use for a lot of people. Um, a lot of times they'll notice that it dramatically decreases their problem. But it doesn't include, completely abolish it either. And so you kind of hang out here and just breathe into, in this case, there'd be a pillow here. And just chill. A lot of times people do this on their bed or on a couch. All right. Sometimes tucking the knees a little bit more so is better for them. Sometimes tucking their shoulder into their body is better for them. And just hanging out. I had a gentleman recently that he had growing pain. He did have confirmed hip arthritis. He had definitely in limitations on his hip range of motion. And I don't think we we're getting the hip range of motion back. Um, but I mentioned to him that um, as I'm doing this, you guys may want to do too. But as I mentioned to him, uh, there's pain and there's function. They're different. Okay. 
We're not going to get the function that hit back probably, but we can reduce the pain. Uh, his outcome measure was actually just standing and lifting his leg. And um, immediately it decreased by about 50% after doing this for probably a minute or two. Uh, and then we went back and did it again and did it again. We did about five, six minutes of it. Uh, and he continued to get better and better and better. And he was blown away by the whole idea. And he's like, why does that even help? Um, well, because in this case, it's probably spinal referred for him. But the hip does lack it does does lack range of motion. And so we need to see if we can get that range of motion back. One way to do that is with, uh, we call this a hip extension uh, exercise. And I'm gonna keep sliding our camera back just so you guys can see. So this one is a, is a, is a slightly different protocol. Um, and it's gonna be here, just like so, okay? I usually have people put their elbow on their knee like the thinker here, and then step, creep the foot out. And then you're going to just try to slowly lower your pocket into that heel, okay? But not getting dramatic with the thing with the back, all right? Because remember, the mechanism of injury is going to be extension and some, some form of hip extension too, too. And so we're just rocking and rocking, okay? Normally, people do this for about like a minute or so, and they test out their hip and see how it feels. For some people, it makes them feel worse, quite honestly, some people make them feel better, and some people you really can't tell, okay? But this rocking one, just like here, as you rock, 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 you might notice it, that it changes, okay? And so if it changes, it's a really good thing, uh, and it just means that this is an adequate first aid, okay? But it doesn't mean it's the end-all, be-all either, because we need to do need to restore hip function, if internal rotation, or as I mentioned that for one of those first slides is if it continues to have issues with rotation, then you will put load into the pubic symphysis, you will put load into the adjacent tissues, the tissues around the groin, and you will continue to have problems. And so restoring the function when you're feeling better is always easiest, but you can do it while you're actually doing things like a first aid as well, which this is a version of our first aid. So. Uh, if you guys are looking for more information on some of this stuff too, I do have a lot of this in a book that I wrote recently. I'll put a link in the description too. Um, actually, it might pop up in the corner. I'll just do a corner pop up a card. Um, but it's a book that I wrote on on hip diagnosis and treatment. Um, and it covers all of the stuff that we talked about today, even ones that we didn't come up, cover either. And um, it's about 70 pages or so. And it lays out a good foundation of, of where you would go after this too. Um, we do have virtuals as well. And we offer something at this point in time, we're doing something called a discovery session. The discovery session is like you meet with someone like me or you meet with Don uh, and we just discuss your case. And if we can help you, we'll say something. If not, then we say we can't. Um, but there's no point in you wasting your time and money trying something that's not going to work. And we can we can pretty much identify if we can help you or not. All right. We've had people do this um, in from distances. That it's too far to travel to us and it's totally OK. Ideally, if you want to come in and see us, that's always the best. Um, but we've had a lot of successful cases where we have not had to physically touch them to give them the relief that they wanted uh, and um, give them back to function and feeling strong and capable again. Um, so uh, I apologize. This was not on the YouTube live as I intended it to be. I'm going to see if I can figure out the YouTube live moving forward to share screens. But I, as you see, there was a lot on the slides. And so um, if you guys are liking this, contact us. Um, info at p2sportscare.com or you can call us 714-502-4243 and we would love to work with you. We have very good success with things like this and I have a lot more information coming on YouTube, hopefully long format like this. So hopefully you guys watch um, the duration of it because I think all the information is uh, important. The long format stuff is important. Uh, I'll see you guys next time.